Thank you. So good afternoon, Newcastle. And I have to say that because I've wanted to say that since I was about five years old. So personal mission, tick. That's off the bucket list. Um, I would like to take you back to a very different day from today, from the hot temperatures outside. I'd like to take you back to February 2010. And it's 8.30 p.m. And I have been in this rehearsal room since 9 a.m. this morning. So I'm a little bit tired and I'm a little bit jaded. I'm absolutely starving hungry. And um, I'm really quite frustrated because this show was just not working. We have got 47 hours until opening night and I personally have to seriously rethink the entire thing. So I send the actors out for a break. I send the crew out for a break and I am in this rehearsal room and I am staring into the dark and I am completely brain dead. So I rummage around in my bag for some chewing gum or just something that's gonna help me think. And in there, I see my current tube reading, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, his exploration into the success story. And it strikes me that I have to ask the question, do these 10,000 hours really relate to the creative process? So on the back of my script, I start to scribble out, I start to do some maths um, about how long I have probably spent in the creative process or a rehearsal room or performing over the last however many years of my professional creative life. And if I was to work that out today, then it would go a little something like this. 19 and a half years multiplied by 30 hours a week on average, sometimes it's a lot less, sometimes it's quite a lot more, in various roles from director, actor, writer, practitioner, etc., etc. Um, it would come in at about 30,000 hours of my life to date. <laughs> wow, I feel like I'm just warming up. And you know what, that is not unusual in creative industry because most of my peers come in at around the same number. So here I am in this rehearsal room, panicking to get it all done, to get it brilliant, to get it amazing, to inspire everyone until the cows come home. And the reality is that under these circumstances, honestly, my level of creative output is make do. It's surface, it's substandard. In fact, every single person in this room is substandard because every single one of us is hyper-cycling. And this picture, this way of working is contributing massively to the current problem that we're facing in creative culture today because we have far too much demand and we have far less time. So if you stop, just stop and zoom out a bit, You've kind of got to imagine that you're Google Maps here, all right? Use your imaginations. And you really look at the picture of our current cultural landscape, then you will see something that is deeply, deeply unsettling. Because creative works are not being given the time, the space, or the resources to find their full rhythm, their full shape, their full depth, to find their orientations. Ultimately, to find the form that creates and leaves a long-lasting cultural impact. Instead, creative works are pushed out too fast, en masse, without enough distinction, and frankly, without enough care. And this is just contributing massively to the problem that we are facing today. Right now, culture is what I have termed hyper-cycling. Hyper being that it's too much, too fast, too loud. Cycling being that it happens again and again and again. Hypercycling is the term used to describe many pieces of work that are pushed out without the investment of what they need, the nourishment. And so many things that are hyped up prove to be lean in substance. Hypercycling is the shortcut of many creative works that are forced out for the purpose of what can only be described as a cultural sugar hit. And not, I might add, for the purpose of any piece of work per se or any project, 
but to satiate the cravings for those who don't understand, nor often really care to, the real processes of creativity and what they need in order to find their richness, their resonance and their connectedness with their audiences. As Al Gore states at the beginning of an inconvenient truth about global warming, if we consider this and we actually acknowledge this, then the imperative to make big changes is inescapable. I put it to you that it's not just the case for climate change, but it's also the case for cultural change. Let's look at the stats. Some recent research from Warwick University showed us that creative jobs increased from 1997 to 2013 from 1.81 million to 2.62 million. In Britain, the arts is the second biggest sector after banking. And it is the fastest growing industry. And the creative industry represents 10 percent of the UK economy and yet direct public spend on arts and culture comes in at just 0.3 percent and whilst the government does invest in arts and culture and creative ventures it does through only through tax relief and there is no overall policy in place for the creative economy none in fact, direct government investment comes in at under 0.1%, which makes no economic sense, never mind cultural sense. So sadly, the inconvenient truth for culture in 2015 is that it needs some big, big changes if we are to avoid making our beautiful cultural landscape turn into a cultural wasteland if we are to avoid passing the ever nearing point of no return amidst all of this hypercycling. It's most evident if you all just pause and reflect on the lack of transcendent figures or movements that have come out of all creative industry over the last 10 years. If you were the curator, for example, of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, then who is gonna be your David Bowie? Who is going to be your Alexander McQueen? Who is going to be your Vivian Westwood, retrospective 10 years from now? Because if we're honest about it, there are very few people coming through who have this cultural resonance and this cultural resonance with their audience. Why? Because most rehearsal times for theatrical works are now half of what they once were if that. In fact, touring theatre, that's dying. Most second books are announced before they're fully conceived, never mind actually written, and many musicians are only signed because they have X number of followers on Twitter, as opposed to what their music actually offers, as opposed to the one's three or six traditional album deal. So if you think about that, then the likes of Prince, the likes of Bob Dylan, the likes of Kate Bush, possibly wouldn't exist today because they wouldn't have been given the time and the space that they needed in their early careers to find their full cultural richness, to find their full resonance. So I have chosen to call this private creative journey, this private space, a crest. This is the thing that we need to hold, we need to shine the light back on in order to reorientate our cultural landscape. But sadly, over the last 18 months of my research into this, my evidence has been consistent, 100%, in that every single person I have spoken to is resonating with the effects of the hypercycling. It's the malaise we feel when we do our work. It's the stresses, it's the frustrations, and it's the regrets, because we haven't had the time that we need. Amidst all of this hypercycling, we have completely forgotten that we love what we do, and to put our attention into valuing the private creative journey, as opposed to getting hijacked onto the public output. 
But there are glimmers of the solution if we just pause and we pay attention to them. I mean, if we were to guard the art of tomorrow in the same way that we guard the art of yesterday, then, you know, things could look quite different. Conversely, if we had treated the likes of Chaplin, Shakespeare, Frida Kahlo, Marlena Dietrich, the Brontes, Virginia Woolf, the list is kind of endless, right? If we had treated those people in the same throwaway manner that we treat the creative culture of today, then it begs the question, would we even have these treasures at all? Because these are the things that give the, give the world its identity. They give the world its independence, they give the world its pride, and they give the world its education. So, as I said, there is a question that needs to be considered, and it's this. Are we all, each and every one of us, responsible for the downfall of creative culture through our ignorance and through our neglectfulness? Because we seriously need to do things differently if we want things to change. But there are glimmers of solution, like I said, and you only have to go to some of the people in my own sort of musical influences to find those solutions. I mean, notably, PJ Harvey, at the beginning of this year, decided she was going to record her new album as an art installation piece at Somerset House in London. So opening the lid on the creative process. And this was something that sold out twice over. It was much talked about because it was offering something new to the creative world. It was offering something that was rich and resonant and something that people really valued. Nick Cave, the lovely Nick Cave, spends about 60 hours a week in his studio, in his creative process. And by his own admission, there is a lot of time of nothing happening. There's a lot of waste. There's a lot of failure. But all of these things are essential. They need the space to exist if stuff that is resonant, rich, is going to ultimately emerge. And let's face it, his work is brilliant, and there is an awful lot of it. So by allowing the full existence of the private creative journey, the crest, we begin to invest into something that is new and is really valuable to our culture today. So I would like to finish by reading a poem that I scribbled down when I was tired on that long, cold, tube journey home back in February 2010. We are hopeless and lost. New ideas run aground into frustrations and stress. What can we do now? Return to our crest, taking our time before we all become the crestfallen, and I'll leave that with you. Thank you. <laughs>